Hello, welcome back to Ask a Creationist. I'm Todd Wood. I'm president of Core Academy of Science. I'm a young age creationist, and I'm here to answer your questions about science and faith, origins, evolution, creation, design, the Bible, Genesis, whatever you got. We're interested in your questions, so send them on in. I'm in the middle of a series right now, a series on evolution. Specifically, is there evidence against evolution? Or as I like to phrase it, is there evidence inconsistent with or poorly explained by evolution? And I want to preface this again by reminding everybody that all scientific models and theories, including creationist models and theories, have holes and inconsistencies and problems. So there's nothing, I think, particularly special about the challenges of evolution, and I don't want anyone to think that I am thinking that I'm so much better than them because I'm not, right? We all have difficulties. We all have things that we don't understand because we're human and we're finite and that's just how it is. Nevertheless, let's take a look this week at one of my favorite things, the evolutionary tree of life. This diagram here is from Darwin's Origin of Species. This is one of the big arguments that he put into sort of the back section of the book. We'll talk about that in a second here. And it was a big eye-opener for me. This was something that I studied as a graduate student. I got into a lot of basically early cellular evolution, trying to understand the phylogeny. Phylogeny, by the way, is a big fancy word for evolutionary tree. So I was trying to understand the phylogeny of these early cells, if evolution were true. I was studying the methods. And yeah, it was really interesting. Let's, let's have a look at it. So a reminder here, thinking about the argument for evolution, sort of the last time we said the sort of standard argument for evolution, which basically begins with variation and ends with the evolution of everything on the planet, isn't really very compelling in the sense that it requires you to sort of extrapolate way beyond anything that you have any sort of familiar, familiarity with or, or experience with. And it's the back half of Darwin's origin, which is the real thing that convinced him of evolution, that evolution was the correct idea and the correct way to understand the history of life. And it's there, I think, that we find the more compelling stuff. So Tree of Life, sort of the end of the book here, towards the almost the last chapter, as he's sort of wrapping things up. So what are we talking about here? Well, how do you make a phylogeny? How do you make an evolutionary tree from critters. So I've got some critters here, fish, uh, peacock, bird, obviously a, a ape, and then myself. And so if you were to make a phylogeny, basically what we're talking about is looking at what critters have the most things in common. And so looking at this uh, set of critters here, I see that the ape and I we all we have hair, we have external ears, we have uh, four limbs, and we have hands at the end of the upper limbs. Uh, we have feet, we have internal bones, we were warm blooded. Lots of lots of characteristics that join the ape and the human together on one branch of that phylogeny. Next, then we could sort of look at the other two critters on there. And I would say the bird is more similar to me and the gorilla than we are to the fish or the bird is to the fish. Bird and I share, for example, four limbs, right? His four limbs are modified as wings, but we still have four, four limbs, four bony limbs. Whereas with the fish, you don't have four limbs and they're not really bony. So I'm putting that bird next. It's very close to the two mammals here. And then that would leave the fish on the outside. Still clearly a vertebrate. It has an internal skeleton. If you've ever had to clean a fish, you know what I'm talking about, that internal skeleton. And it's made of bone for the most part. But that's really a lot of where the similarity ends. Uh, fish don't have lungs. Fish breathe through gills. Birds have lungs and so do we and so forth. So this is the basic idea of making a phylogeny. Now, there, of course, are computer programs that do this much better and more rigorously, and they analyze data very carefully in order to generate the best evolutionary tree, the best phylogeny. Now, is it possible then to have 
characteristics that contradict the evolutionary tree. Is it possible that there could be two remote branches that have a characteristic in common? And the answer is, oh, good heavens, yes. Oh, my goodness, all the time. It happens all the time. And in fact, the idea of a single evolutionary tree is generally a fiction. Usually, there are multiple trees that fit the data relatively equally well. Each one of those trees then gives a slightly different variation on the evolutionary origin of the, of the taxa, the, the species that they're talking about. So it's possible, fully possible, to have things that don't fit the evolutionary tree. Now, having said that, does that mean that there are no evolutionary trees? Well, good question. So consider, for example, the classic evolutionary sequence, right? The fish, the salamander here next to the fish, and then the, the reptile, the lizard, and then again, the mammals, and me. And so there's a sense that we have from watching lots of evolutionary movies and lots of evolutionary documentaries and so forth, that there is a progression that goes on here from sort of fish to things that go in and out of water to things that live mostly on land. And then as you move up to more and more what we think of as advanced creatures, right? And so it turns out when you look at your computer programs and you count up all these characteristics, genetic characteristics, morphological characteristics, and what have you, you do get a nice tree. And it does seem to make sense and fit pretty well with the evolutionary expectations. But what if you did that with a different set of organisms? Let's say we looked at the different classes of mammals. So what is the evolutionary relationship of a cat to a giraffe or an armadillo or a walrus or a rat? And suddenly what seemed really obvious with the fish, the salamander, the reptile, and the mammal suddenly becomes a bit more confusing. It isn't any more really obvious what kind of evolutionary tree these animals here might be related by. Same deal with the different uh, groups of animals. Uh, the snail here representing the mollusks and the crab representing the arthropods, the jellyfish, the cnidarians, and then the, the vertebrates of the chordates represented by the fish. So we might suggest that the jellyfish goes in the most primitive position on the tree because it is the simplest organization, but the relative relationship of the different creatures that make up the major groups of animals, again, not obvious. And you can get even more specific than that. We can just shift our, our view over to insects. We could talk about you know, butterflies and grasshoppers and ants and dragonflies and so forth cockroaches and ladybugs and so on. But an obvious evolutionary tree that relates them all together, we might, we might be very firm on affirming that they are in fact all insects, but relating them together on an evolutionary tree isn't obvious. Does that mean that there are no, there is no evolutionary tree? Well, no, that's not what it means. But I will say that the, the kinds of evolutionary relationships that connect these groups together have really only been worked out to some measure of satisfaction, maybe in the last 10 to 20 years, maybe 10 to 15 years. Uh, it's been fairly recent. And, you know, that's maybe 10% of the time that we've had since evolution has dominated the thinking in science, which I think is really interesting. Now, why is it that these conflicts in phylogenetics happen? Why is it that there are characteristics that don't fit the tree? Well, there are all sorts of reasons that scientists give, and I think they're all moderately reasonable, right? There's always going to be noise in your data, no matter what you have. There's going to be some kind of random background stuff that you've got to control for. And horizontal gene transfer and recombination and endosymbiosis and hybridization and complete linear sorting, these are all pretty well-known phenomena that could cause the tree to become untree-like. So here's four Doolittles. Uh, here's one of four Doolittles versions of the uh, his his idea of the evolutionary tree. Now, doesn't look much like a tree anymore. Looks much more like, say, a bramble or uh, a tumbleweed or something like that. Uh, 
so the fundamental idea of evolution being this, this notion of divergence in, in Darwin's mind that leads to wider and wider divergence that then gives you basically a nested hierarchy pattern of classification at the end. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Things are much more complicated than that. Now again, remember, I don't think this is, a, this is the death blow to evolution. I think there's something much more important going on here. I think that evolution is too easy. I think the pattern of similarities here that we're seeing between organisms is much more complicated than any, than any evolutionary tree, even if you want to patch it up. And as I think back through the history of science, I think about the way astronomers tried to patch up the Ptolemaic system, which had circular orbits for all the planets. And it doesn't fit because the best model for orbiting planets is not circles, it's ellipses, it's moderately squished circles. But it's very close to circles so that you could patch your circles with what they called epicycles. And to me, the way things are changing in the science of phylogenies and the science of evolutionary trees reminds me a lot of this. We're patching up places on the evolutionary tree that don't fit. And we're saying this, this particular lack of fit is because of endosymbiosis. And this particular lack of fit over here is because of hybridization. And over here, it's because of incomplete lineage sorting. It's the same pattern at every scale. At every single scale, you have these trees that just don't match everything else the way they're supposed to. You have characteristics that don't fit the standard evolutionary tree. But we make up different reasons for it in different locations. To me, that reminds me of epicycles. They're making up, they're making, you know, they're patching up their orbital models in order to make their model fit the data, even though the model, if they just picked a better model, would fit the data much more naturally. All right, well, that's all I have to say about phylogenies. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, visit us at Corsi.org. There you find links to our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You will also find a place where you can donate to this ministry. If you're interested in, in raising up a new generation of creation researchers, then that is exactly what we're interested in too. So we would love to have you join our support team. If you hated this video, great. Leave a dislike. If you like the video, leave a like. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to click that bell if you'd like to get notifications when we put up a new video. And that's it. Next time we're going to consider some more evidence that I think is difficult to fit in with evolution. There's probably a couple of more episodes of these before we get back to the regular questions. But send your questions in anyway. We're still interested. And thank you for watching this episode.